This is the Body Wise Podcast. Thank you for joining Laura and Christina for another intimate exploration of collective wisdom. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Body Wise Podcast. I am really excited for our guest today. Um, before we get started, I'd like to ask you all and remind you to please subscribe and leave a review. Um, those are always very helpful. So today we're talking all about the book industry, the book writing process, um, and you know ethics and equity and social justice in, in business and content creation. And I'm super excited to have Rebecca Baruki here, Bex. You might know her on Instagram at Bex Life. Um, she is knows all about writing books. Um, she's the founder of Bex Life uh, and Row House Publishing. She's a mother to five, a meditation guide, a birth doula, a mentor for creative leaders, an author and publisher. And she's taught meditation, you know, for years and really has had this like, you know, decade of um, working in the wellness and creative space. Um, and through um, We Penny Press, which is um, like kind of like the children's imprint of Row House. She has an amazing nonprofit that gets um, books into schools and these um, books are, and authors into schools and the books center around um, emotional and mental health for children and like problem solution, which they're beautiful. Um, Row House Publishing is her newest and latest endeavor. And we're going to get all about it, but it is going to change the publishing world. And I'm so, so thrilled for you guys to learn more about that. And again, just more about how the publishing work, how the publishing world works. If you've ever wanted to write a book or get published, this episode um, is for you. Um, and as well, if you're someone who's struggling to tie in, you know, maybe more social justice um, work into your business. This episode is also for you. Um, Rebecca is passionate. She's outspoken. She's extremely um, intelligent and interesting and amazing. And I just, I love, I love talking to her. So let's, let's get to it. Rebecca, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I want to ask, do you prefer Rebecca or Bex? Um, either one is fine. Whatever's easier <laughs> these days. Okay. We'll go, we'll go with it. We'll call, I'll call you Bex then. Cause it's your handle at Bex life on Instagram, which I love following by the way. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, all about publishing books. I try to, <laughs> I'm learning a lot. I, I, I can't, I can't know everything about anything. I'm very much a student, but I, I know some stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, you publish your own books, you're publishing people's books. Now you have your, we plenty press, you have row house. Mm -hmm. I'd love to go into like, how does someone get started? Like, what is this magical, mystical world of book, you know, writing that people think like, oh, well, I want to write a book. I have an idea, but there's, there's almost like, if you Google, like how to get published, <laughs> it's like, I mean, even agents of publishing houses, I feel like there's like the golden gates, <laughs> you, can't, you know, there's like bouncer. Yeah. I don't know. You can't get in. Right. That's true. What's up no, with that? I, so how, what's up with that? I mean, can I say white supremacy? Can I just start off with Let's that? Go. I mean, it, it's like in any other industry, um, in every other area of our lives, our education, our uh, legal system, there are gatekeepers, there are oppressors, there are people, no matter how hard they work, it's almost impossible to reach the so-called top. And it's no different in publishing. Um, in publishing, the gatekeepers would be, you know, the very big four publishing houses. It used to be big five, but there was a big merger uh, recently between Simon & Schuster and Penguin Random House. So now it's this big four. Uh, every single one of them has a white cis man at the helm. And they've been doing things the way they've been doing them for 100 years. It's, it's, it hasn't been changed. Um, and then there's the agents that are gatekeepers. You have to have an agent to get in front of one of these editors at one of these giant publishers. And the agents are, you know, there's, there's a lot of good ones, but there's a lot of uh, agents that really don't have their finger on the pulse of what's happening. They're not really interested in showcasing voices that are marginalized or that haven't been heard. They, you know, they wanna make money, they wanna sell books. So, you know, money is really driving the chain um, or train. And it's, uh, I think that was a Freudian slip chain because that's what it can I was be like. Thinking that too. I'm like, <laughs> yep. it's, 
because you know it's keeping us in chains keeping right. our voices um suppressed but yeah it's it's money over people every time and um that's created a situation where books should be giving us knowledge and should be elevating us in the way that we think but um in a lot of ways they're holding us back as a society right i yeah. agree i think that that was my experience and i was very disillusioned by it when i was published and then even when i tried to branch out from my publisher and get and as a as a published author i could not get an agent like literally talked to like four different people who were like nah like you're not gonna sell enough books it's not worth it and i'm like but but I've already sold a bunch. I, I work my butt off, but I don't know. It's like, and I, I feel that I see that thing, especially in the wellness space where you see the same people, like how many books is one, like one dude has like 10, 15 books and just pumping them out there. And he's not even like, you know, they're all ghost written. They're not writing them yep. themselves. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, but how, but it's just because they have the right, the, they already have, they're already at the top. So it's a money-making machine. Um, mm -hmm. And, and there is no, you know, diversity in that. And I, I do find that to be sad and, and it's, yeah. and yeah. innovation isn't safe right innovation isn't comfortable uh and you know people who have been enjoying a certain level of privilege and have a, a certain amount of wealth it's very easy to sit back and go this is good <laughs> or i'm just gonna keep doing the same thing to get more of the same right. innovation is risk-taking so it's you you do see um, some really exciting names out there. You see some really exciting topics. You know, 2020, we got to see a lot of uh, emerging black and brown authors, but they're speaking on anti-racism, which is important and necessary, but then it's still pigeonholing black and brown people to talking right. about oppression and suffering. Right. right, where they're also chefs and doctors and psychologists and, you know, yoga Scientists and meditation. And right, novelists. right. <laughs> like they don't just want to talk about this. They want to talk about their expertise. Right, right, right. So, you know, so, even with progress, it's still kind of like, you know, four steps forward, three steps back. And we find ourselves repeating again, the same patterns. And it's still about following a trend. You know, unfortunately, you know, tragically, we saw a black man be murdered by police on television. And, and the, the good that came out of it was this consciousness and this uprising, these uprisings that happened all around the world, really. But it, publishers were following a trend. Right. So, you know, is it going to be, you know, next year that anti-racism isn't popular anymore? So they, they drop the books. And, and this is the problem. Like, you know, I think people that are delivering knowledge, you know, even though they're a business, they have a responsibility to the public to be putting out good, worthwhile stuff. And they really haven't claimed that responsibility. I don't mm -hmm. see it. Right. Absolutely. That's true. I think that the quality sometimes um, it's about, it is very much about like, right. Money. It's, it goes down to money and sales and the trends. And it's just so sad because when you think of like, well, is this a quality book or is this person just going to sell a lot of books? And like, you know, you, you obviously get them just really trying to put out and like, they will flood the market. Then all of a sudden it's like, 10,000 books on the same exact thing that come out in the same season. And you're like, what? Yeah, but let's talk about money though. Cause okay. here's the thing. We need money. You, you can, <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy money. Money yeah. allows me to buy neon hoodies. Like I'm wearing right now. Like money allows me to buy like my specialty tea blends. Mm -hmm. Um, but you can make money and do good. You can do mm -hmm. good business and be profitable. You can be equitable and be profitable. The issue is this, this capitalist white supremacist idea that we have to hoard money and that it's okay. You know, you don't get to be a billionaire by working hard. You get to be a billionaire by exploiting people. Like that's the only path because you will never work hard enough to make a billion dollars. It's right. impossible. So we really have to shift our mindsets around the, you know, away from this binary that you could either be good or you could be rich, that you can have money. You don't have to have all the money. Right. You can have a good amount of money and good could be done in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, I'm trying to do with Row House, you know, offering our, our authors a more equitable contract. We're paying four times industry average for royalties. We're giving everyone a flat rate advance that will actually allow them to write their books and pay their editors. Like imagine that. And everybody gets the same, no matter the size of your platform. Um, because if you sell more books, you'll, you'll make more money. Like we think that's awesome. And because it's a better split, we're actually in partnership with our authors. So we're forced to work hard for them too. Mm -hmm. And 
believe me, I have the numbers in front of us. Like we're going to be profitable, right? Like we can give away or not give away. We can pay what the authors deserve and still be profitable. No, that's amazing. I know I was, when I saw, and you know, the, what you were going to be doing for a house. I was like, that's incredible. I mean, like I didn't get that. Was, I didn't get, I didn't get $40,000 in advance. I got, I got maybe I got like 10 for my yeah, book. Let's talk and, about it. <laughs> you know, and it was like, you work a year and a half before you see a dollar in royalties. And then mm-hmm. on top of that, there was very, like, there's no support really from the, you know, people always think like, okay, so I want to publish a book. How do I sell it? Because let's talk about people without platforms wanting to write books, which I think that you don't have to have a platform to be able to write a book because just because you're good on social media doesn't mean that you have anything worthwhile to say. Right. Um, yeah. But unfortunately that's, I mean, I'll tell you with my former publisher, Hay House, you know, I went to the writer's workshop and the CEO got up there and he was very plain and on, and thank goodness he was honest with those numbers right. because he's like, look, we want to see you have a newsletter list of 30,000 people. Right. Period. And right. it's like, what? <laughs> Like that's the first criteria, not, you know, what impact are you going to make on the world? Like, who are you? It's like, what are your numbers? So unfortunately you, you kind of do have to have this platform or at least know people that have big platforms that are going to promote your book to get these book deals. And even then it's going to be totally up to you to sell the book. Totally up to you. So a publisher is ostensibly someone who prints and distributes your book. That's what a publisher does. Right. Distribution is great. They'll get you into like Barnes and Noble, hopefully, you know, Target, you know, put on Amazon and get on Amazon, but like, they'll do that for you. So they'll get you in front of eyes, but they're not going to sell the book for you. Right. So it's still up to you. So people think like, oh, all right, I'm going to be, you know, we were talking in before, you know, you hit record and you were saying like, people think they're going to write a book and be rich and famous. It's like, n- no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, okay, we, this is a very dark podcast <laughs> because we're, I mean, we're, we're, we're tired. We <laughs> okay. Some people are though. Some people, it happens for some yeah. people. It does. It does. Yeah. And we look, we've written multiple books, so it can't be all that bad. Like people say like, how bad was childbirth? I'm like, I've had five children. So it's not, like, I did it again. Right. You want, right. I agree because you, but that I think goes down to people who love, like I, I, I love writing my books. And when you put in them the same, you know, when you like, when you want to help people, when you're like, I'm putting this in here because someone can pay $25 for this book or $20 or whatever it's on sale and change their life. Yeah, You know, like I put all of my NTP training into my second book. So it's like, you don't have to pay to work with me. You can literally buy my book, which is like horrible marketing skills, whatever. But I, I think like, it's accessible marketing. Right. I love it. But that's what yeah. I, that's what I want. I'm like, I don't want mm-hmm. someone to have to pay, you know, thousands of dollars to work with holistic practitioners for months. And when it's like, you can just, we can write it down and like put it in a book. And I think that again, people write books. We write books because we really want to. Because we want to, you got to love it. You have to love you gotta it. love it. If, right. if you know a book can be a business strategy. If, if you are a coach, if you are someone that has some kind of program or organization, and you want to get the the word out, and you want to reach more people, a book is like the the best business card right. for real. Like my, you have four minutes to change your life. That got so many people into my coaching program. It's because people wanted to learn more about being able to manage their anxiety and depression in everyday life, and just create, you know a better life for themselves in simple ways. So that was, re- that's what blew up my business. Right. Um, but for real, you know, and I'll tell you managing the mother load, it didn't sell as much as my second book. It was kind of a, a very niche subject. It wasn't parenting. It was about motherhood, but I still like, will read a passage from that book and go, I, I love this book. <laughs> like yeah. the love is in it. And that's why I continue to write. I've, I've enjoyed a lot of success from my books. I'm very lucky in that regard, uh, people love my books and they've been gracious enough to share them, but I will always write no matter if it's making me a dollar or not. Right. Yeah, I agree. I think I'll be in the same boat. I mean, so we're not, we're not all bitter people. <laughs> um, <laughs> very early in the morning when we're recording this. <laughs> true. That's true. Um, but I, let's talk a little bit about what does make a book successful, right? Because I agree that Sometimes it's a little bit, I feel, and again, I'm more on the outside, just on the creator side, like it's a crapshoot, you know, like my first book for all intents and purposes did better than I thought it would. It got into Casco, which was great. But then the second book, not only was the pandemic, but also 
I just felt like, you know, people, I don't know. Sometimes you hear that. Well, the first one, the second one won't do as good as the first one, but then you see some amazing books that I run into and I'm like, this is amazing. Why didn't I ever hear about this? And I'm at the bookstore like what? And then of course the same people who have like all of, you know, all the followers, you always hear about their book launches, you know, but so what is that? What, what makes like, what, what's the secret sauce? <laughs> what's it? I, I wish I knew. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll tell you this though. What I believe truly is that when something is of service, then it will be successful mm. and successful doesn't always mean the most numbers, but the most impact all around. So, you know, my little books, I'll call them my little books because they were good sellers. They weren't, you know, top, top sellers, but the impact that they had on people's lives made those people fans. And so they want to buy all my books. They buy, you know, they bought my books for adults and now they buy my books for children. They want to come to my events. They want to be part of my coaching programs. Like a $10 book can turn into a customer that over time, you know, spends $10,000 on your products. Mm -hmm. So it has to make an impact. It has to be congruent with your values. And I'm talking fiction, nonfiction, whatever. It has to impact people on a soul level for it to be uh, successful. So if you're writing a book as just as catharsis and, you know, writing a book can definitely be therapy. It, it can be an amazing process, but if you're writing it just for you, it might be better to self-publish and like, you know, sell a hundred copies to friends and family. You have to ask yourself, what is the impact? What do I want people to feel when they're reading my book? How, what do I want them to know for sure when they're finished reading my book? Like what mark do I want to leave? And everything that goes into that book should serve that purpose. And again, it could be a cookbook, it could be a romance novel, but you have to think about that, that reader. And that's, you know, I've read a lot of books that no one has bought and they've changed my life. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's crazy. I actually was telling that a friend, actually, he owns a food truck where I used to work in San, San Diego. And he's like, I want to write a book about my crazy life story. And I'm like, it's not that crazy, but okay. And so, you know, but he, he likes, you know, I'm like, you go to Burning Man, David. <laughs> I don't know if that's like, you know, whatever. I'm like, you might be crazy, but, but anyways, we're talking about this and he's saying about this book and I'm like, and I told him that I'm like, but who are you writing this for? Like your burner friends? I'm like, bro, you have to think about like, what is this? What, what is the reader going to get out of this? And I agree. So it's, like, it's an act of service, really. Yeah. It's what it kind of has to, it boils down to. Um, yeah. so I'm trying I mean, that's to a hard answer for me anyway, because it's like, I'm always going to go towards service. I'm not that's true. money driven. So you're going to ask someone else and say like, what makes a successful book? And they're going to talk about the marketing plan, the launch and, and all of those things are very important. But again, my success to me is touching someone's heart. Right. right. Yeah. That's true. I think, I think over time things might have a pop, you know, there's that thing of like, well, if a book has to like pop at launch, you know, and then that's when it gets the visibility. But I do think that over time, you're right. There is that trickle you know, where it, it might not be as like fancy or, you know, it might not seem as exciting, but you do reach people over time. And then that's, I get a thousand five-star reviews on Amazon. <laughs> that's my tip. And that's, for, that's actually for real. If you get a thousand five-star reviews on Amazon, your book will be successful in perpetuity. It will right. continue to sell because Amazon is going to keep pushing it forward. So right. there's my, there's my hot tip. It's not easy, but you can do it. Call all your friends. Okay. So, <laughs> so everyone review my second book now. <laughs> first book has got the, the first book got it but the second one is just just struggling it's okay um I know it's always hard people like when you're in a third one I'm like I, I'm not recovered from the second one slow down slow burn it's a it's letter letter simmer I know it's really crazy how that happens though like the difference between again timing has a lot to do with it I think of course time of year season you know no one can plan for a pandemic but a lot of people, you know, we get this question and I get, I'm the person who wants to help people. So when someone says, I want to write a book, I'm like, great. I'll, like, I'll hook you up with like, you know, when I was with, with, um, when I was still with uh, victory belt, I was sending them people over all the time. I'm like, Hey, I have a friend who wants to write a book. Cause I think that, that there's like that everyone's welcome at the table. Um, but I think that there is this notion, right. We talked about this a little with the gatekeepers of like the kind of closed doors or the agents. And I feel that there's why, like, I mean, is it, like, why has it got to be like that? I mean, and we talk about white supremacy, but even within people who, let's say, have good content and have an audience and what, what are, you know, 
what goes into picking? Like, how is there picking and choosing? Like, what do you think is like, if someone wants to pitch a book, essentially, I guess that's what I'm asking. Like, what should they start with? There, well, you have to remember that there are human beings at the table making these decisions. And right. it's, you know, it's based on market, but it's also based on their personal likes and dislikes. And right. again, you know, 79% of the publishing industry overall, this is agents, publishers, authors, editors, everybody, 79% white, mm. 90% of authors are white. Most of the books about, about black, black and brown people and folks with marginalized identities are written by white people. So you, so when you're selling a book, you are most likely selling it to a white person. Mm -hmm. So if you're a white person, even though I, all white people aren't alike, obviously, so please don't at me. Um, <laughs> you, you will have a better than average chance of getting it picked up because you're talking about things maybe culturally or uh, class-wise that might line up or you know reflect that person's personal um, experience. But <clears throat> when you're selling a book, it's important to think about the audience, but if you're going to a publisher, and this feels a little bit icky to me, but you also have to think like, how am I gonna sell this to an agent? How am I selling this to the publisher? What are their likes and dislikes? And, and I'll tell you my agent, I love her. I love my agent. Um, her name is Wendy Sherman. I send her, people to her all the time. Um, I am a middle-aged uh, biracial woman, grew up like in a little row home, very poor, <laughs> like, poor. Like I say, I'm broke now. I know it's a big difference between being poor and broke. I grew up poor. Um, I'm not broke though. That's just, I just buy too many hoodies. That's my problem. <laughs> it's all into the hoodies. Knock them off one day. The hoodies. <laughs> and my investment. <laughs> um, and you know, Wendy's a middle-aged white woman in New York city. Like we have some similarities. We have many, many differences. And sometimes I can tell, like, I'll be talking to her and she's like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but I support you, you know? And she said as much, like, I don't have this experience, but I support right. you. So you are going to be selling to people who have no idea, especially if you're someone who, you know, identifies as having some kind of marginalized identity, or you have a very unique story, they might have no idea what you're talking about. So it's really important that if you are selling to an agent, you get an agent that not just the biggest and baddest, but really believes in you, gets your story and can advocate for you. But yeah, but that's a, that's a major problem, the gatekeeping. That's why at Row House Publishing, even though we are um, looking to be a, uh, you know, a major competing with the majors, we do not have the requirement that you have an agent to submit to us. We have an open submission policy. Okay. So tell us about Row House. So you, I mean, this was like last in the last year, kind of just, like, you were like, we're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> it was last October. decision. <laughs> yeah. So we're recording now it's April. Um, and in October, because of, to say it kindly, Drama. philosophical differences <laughs> regarding race and class, I left my last publisher. I left Hay House. Um, I had a contract with them for my children's book. I was also a mentor in their Diverse Wisdom Initiative, which was an initiative to bring in more black and brown voices. Um, we were just at an impasse over some issues that I thought were, were critical to my community. So I left, uh, I think that was like October 3rd or 4th. And literally the day after my girlfriend, Kristen texts me and she's like, why don't you just start your own Hay House? And I <laughs> Of course, I'm the jokes that I am. I'm like, cool, let's call it Bay House, like Boo Bay, you yeah. know. But so she didn't know, she didn't okay. get it. So it took her a few days. She's like, I'm the white lady from California, I don't know. <laughs> so she it took her a few days, but she's like, no, 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 I'm serious. Um, and it just, it you know, I get an idea, I get a little, you know, bug in my butt, and I'm ready to go. So okay, we had a business proposal by November. Um, we were pitching investors by December. Then that little insurrection happened at the Capitol, kind of like put things, the whole nation on a, on a standstill. Oh. But we picked back up. And um, now we have five authors signed. We have another author that I'm speaking to today, actually. And I think we're ready to, to get him on board. Um, it's a beautiful lineup that, you know, the best of the best in the industry are like, how'd you do that? Um, and we are on our way to publishing, like we're in it. Uh, we offer something, like I said earlier, something that's very different, a brand new model in publishing. It's an equitable, transparent contract. Everybody gets the same deal. 
everybody. And it is a fair deal. It is, it is, a it, gen- is a, it is generous. I wouldn't call it fair. I'm it's generous. It's amazing. Well, it, that's what fair is to me. You know what I'm right. saying? Like, right. It should be that fair way. Fair. Right. I and, mean, cause not only are they getting a great advance, but their authors are making more on their books than they make with any other publishing house. Yeah. Which is why we've, we've drawn people like Julia Diaz, who has, you know, close yes. to 5,000 five-star reviews on her first book on oh Amazon. Gosh. And, right. and uh, you know, Maisha T. Hill, who has a platform, Check Your Privilege, with nearly 700,000 followers. Like, they're coming to us not just because of our mission, but because it's, it actually makes economic sense. Right, for them. right. And going back to money, right? Because these people can't sell these books. They can sell a ton of books. And they know that they're going to make, in the long run, more inc- better income, right, yeah. from this. And which is, which again, when creatives and especially marginalized women, you know, who are creatives who do this creative work, like pay them and pay them well, (laughs) like that's amazing. And, you know, I, as a, as a person who's been online for a long time and had a business online, I say, I wear my, my politics and my faith and my beliefs and my values, not only on my sleeve, but on my chest, (laughs) like I'm known for my message tees or hoodies that I wear every single day. Um, and it's going to be the same with Row House. Like we are, we are taking a definitive stand um, that is rooted in social justice. We require that our authors have a social justice practice and their work, no matter what it is. We have a, a birth worker, we have a, a business coach, we have someone who's writing a literary memoir. Uh, Julia Diaz is talking about witchcraft and and her indigenous uh, faith. So. All of that, though, is told through the lens of equity and social justice. So that's really important to us. And we're also highlighting, we're taking all authors. Um, One of our authors is a white woman, uh, but their work centers people with marginalized identities, people who've been pushed out of the mainstream for one reason or another. And that's really important to us. And, And we're not looking to reflect the stats. Like I said, 79% of uh, publishing is white that is not reflective of society. Right. Um, but we're, we want to swing it the other way because, you know, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, when they, she said, they said, uh, how many women on the, should there be on the Supreme Court for you to be satisfied? And she said nine, right. like all of them. Right. And why not? Because why we've not? had nine men for so long. Right. right. So what if, I mean, you go into the bookstore, 90% of the authors are white. We don't blink an eye. If 90% were black, what would you say? Right. right. <laughs> so, and we're, we're swinging that pendulum. Cause we think that, you know, too many people have been underrepresented. So That's super exciting. Yeah. I'm super excited. <laughs> That's amazing. That's I can't wait till these books start rolling out. It's going to be amazing. Oh my gosh. The, and the authors, the crew, I mean, I already see our, for our Forbes, uh, uh, feature with yeah. like the six authors and, and, you know, me and my, my partner, and it's just going to be, it's going to be wild. That's going to be amazing. I think that it's absolutely needed. I think that again, it's scary, right? Cause you mentioned it's not safe. I mean, mm-hmm. this has been, luckily you, mean, you, you know how to meditate because. <laughs> but like I said, I've been poor. I mean, I'm not that scared. Right. <laughs> you know, right. it's like, I've been speaking out. My parents were pacifists and they were also activists. Right. Um, you know, I'm someone, you know, and, and like, please take no offense to this. This is, this is just my truth. Like I've never said the Pledge of Allegiance. My parents always um, rooted in me, like your, your allegiance to your fellow man and your sibling and, and borders have nothing to do with it. So it was, um, this is where I come from. And it's, uh, you know, what I want to put forward in the world and what I want to put out in the world. And because of that, having, you know, kind of a life rooted in justice and equity, like, people already been mad at me (laughs) it's like whatever and also if I blow up my career you know I'm putting up quotes if I blow up my career like I've been I'm not I'll never be that poor again right I'll say that it's never gonna be that um because I do have the privilege of being able-bodied and being able to have some resources right I think that but I think it's it's important to talk about this because people think like well I can't I I want to leave my business out of it. You know, I get that a lot of like, well, you know, I, it's like, I can, I'll talk about politics on my personal stuff or, you know, mm-hmm. but, and a lot of people feel um, that, you know, with your place of business, it should be separate from that. And, and I think that, of course, I think that's rooted in fear of, right. Losing money of it, yeah. but it's I, also rooted I, in a lot of privilege. It's, it's able to have right. the choice if you, that's because that's the thing. If you have, 
you can't be a black owned business and have like the black shopkeeper there. And it like, I'm because skin color is political, right? You can't be like, I'm just not going to get into politics. Like your existence is political, <laughs> right? <laughs> so for you, for a white shopkeeper to be able to hide behind white skin, which is the privilege that's putting forward and saying like, I don't want you to know that I vote Republican or Democrat. I don't want you to know that I like or dislike gay people. Like that's a choice rooted in privilege that other people don't have. Out gay people can't hide that. Like, right. you know, like if they want to live a life in integrity and joy. So right. it's, um, it's just really interesting when people say that, and, you know, and I hear it a lot and, and beyond privilege, which makes me angry. And then just the, the money over people, which makes me also angry. I personally want to know who I'm giving my money to. I agree. I so, agree. You know, it's, it's important to me if you're baking my cake, if you would hate my trans son and not make him a cake you know right. like these things are important to me and and I have those conversations even you know I have a trans son and we were signing him up for jujitsu and I um called up the owner of the dojo and I was like look it's not gonna be an argument from me I just need you to know that my son is trans we want to sign him up and I just want to know if the culture of the dojo is going to support him mm -hmm. he was like absolutely bring him in we're so excited <laughs> like it was, so, and it was and it's been such a wonderful home for him but it's important that sure. i you have the values that are gonna keep my family safe right absolutely you know? yeah and you can make those choices i mean i was I, I it was weird because this summer or last summer and i was in tampa and i was getting lines for the shades for the house and some company I found online and, you know, local place and they're there. And the guy says something like, so I don't do the installation. I send some guys, but don't worry. You know, I, they're all very like, they're safe. They're not going to rob, you know, they're not, you know, you'll be safe or I vet them. And I was just kind of like, you know, because it's like, he didn't say they were black, but that's what he was saying. And I was just like, I'll call you <laughs> and then did it, you know, I canceled my order and totally like, cause I had to put out the deposit with these people. And I had like totally called the wife and was like, listen, <laughs> my husband can't give her a whole story and got my money back. I was like, I, I can't, you know, we can't do this right now. And I was like, and then I found someone else who wasn't racist and gave them my money because I don't want to pay someone like that. And of course, who even like the people who work for him, like what environment is that like for them, my money. So I agree. I think we should like, knowing where you're giving your money and the same thing with like people who with my books people who are like i'm i'm throwing away your book i'm like fine i'm like i already got paid for that and so i'm like you can do whatever you want with it <laughs> yeah. well you know your politics are not separate from you they're they not your values right. um and whether you know i live in in a, a very small new jersey town new jersey is a very blue very democratic state but i live in a farming community where 93 percent of the population voted for trump in the last election mm -hmm. okay they have their flags out they put on their businesses and for business around here to put up a trump flag it gets them business and it's like all right good for you like you know you got your people and i'm not going to give you my money and that's my choice too. Like, this is America. Like, this is, these are the choices that we get. And I, I, I have more respect in just this regard for the business that will put up the Trump flag than, you know, the lifestyle coach, even though she is like liberal in her politics, would be afraid to talk about it because she doesn't want to alienate the people that disagree with her. It's like, I just, and, and I'll say this too. When people come to me for advice, and they will tell me something that they're doing and, and I'll give them the advice. And then they say, well, you know, well, I like to do it this way. I say, well, how's that working out for you? Like you're here. So how's it working out for you? And when you ask me how something's working out for me, I consider my whole community. I consider everybody. Like, how am I serving my community? How am I showing up in the world? When I see people making decisions to not share their politics, to not speak up, to not platform what I believe should be platformed, which is, um, you know, messages of equity and inclusion and justice for all. Um, I, I want to ask them, like, how's it working out for them? Because we are in this mess right now because people have chosen to be silent. Right. So 
it's it's not working out for us. It's not. Right. <laughs> it's not right. working out. I mean, us. when people try and downplay like everything that's happened and like when what with 2020 like ignited and it was kind of brewing. I mean, it's been brewing and then it just like imploded. But it's like this is like the current day civil rights movement. And I think about like even the like super whitewashed version of like, you know, the civil rights movement like Martin Luther King that they teach kids in school even then, right? I think I look at these people I'm like, "What? You know what side you're on?" I'm like, you're not with Rosa Parks and I'm okay. You're not on their side. Mm -mm. This is history again. So I'm like, what side are you on? Like, really, you have to think about like when they think back about this year and they're going to teach 2020 in the history books eventually. Like, think yeah. about Thank what you. side, like what, like if history are like, are you on? And I think about them because I don't think people realize because they're just sitting in their privilege and their comfort. And like, I don't want to get involved. And I'm like- it's so interesting to me, especially when people talk about the older generation. And right now when we're talking about- That was the- <laughs> but when people when people are talking about boomers you know they were the hippie generation we forget right like it's like my parent my mom was a hippie right she was like a flower child and all those things so people will say well like oh that's just their generation and I'm like no my uncle was in Alabama registering people to vote in the 60s like this is this is, people were this too so it's interesting to me um you know people who are choosing to be silent now and or choosing to just like opt out it's like I think about all those people you know back then and who they've grown up to be and how much we like you know I would say my friends are like boomer this and boomer that it's like you're you're them. <laughs> like you're those, you're those people who just like sat around and didn't do anything right. um, while other people were marching and other people were protesting or, you know. Right. Right. And I, right. And even, I mean, just there's so many things of like the last year was like, I think people forget history or like they don't teach it properly in school. You know, there was a whole thing. I don't even want you to get into this on air, because, but there was there was like um for abraham lincoln and mike and my kids asynchronous uh -huh. learning there was a video that they linked and there was a woman on youtube reading to children and like i don't know how they choose which videos to whatever but i don't always look at all my child's curriculum because mm. you know but nobody i remember that right but i was this this I, one I, I was like when it comes to those things because they taught christopher columbus last year and i about lost my shit so i had to like you know uh, over dinner kind of you know, unschool him or decolonize his education. And we, we've done a lot of that where I have to buy, I mean, I buy him all the books like separately from what they're teaching him in school. And especially with MLK and Rosa Parks and all that. But he, they, this, this woman was reading a thing on Abraham Lincoln, which again, the version that the white savior version that they do with about like, you know, with Abraham Lincoln is a little bit like, what? Um, but this woman finishes reading the book and then talks about, it's so sad that they are, taking down statues and ruin our history and then like changes into a blue lives matter shirts oh and i was like <laughs> you know and the police they protect us and we have to respect them and this whole i mean oh. i <clears throat> i was like what and so i mean i lost my shit and i emailed the school and it was this whole thing and they were like oh we didn't see the end it was the wrong link and i'm like how is this video that went out to the entire second grade you're telling me no one watched it to the end and it's been up close to Abraham Lincoln didn't even like black people. He did not. That's exactly what I told her. I was like literally copying and pasting his quotes where he's like, they should be separate and they're not the same. You know, I'm like, yeah. I'm like, and the, I'm like, and teaching and, and, and centering him as this like savior of black people. I'm like, it's completely inaccurate. I'm like, and I told some black people back to Africa. That, I mean, it, was it was, I was just like, I mean, and those things are happening and what's, and this is happening. Like this happened this year. Like this happened like last month. Yeah. No, and I mean, we, we read, and, and again, I think that this very much has a lot to do with, with the, the, um, the conversation because this is about knowledge and this is right. about what stories we're choosing to tell and who is telling the stories. Right. So you know, my kids, my first grader was learning about George Washington and right before, it was right before President's Day, so it must have been in January, we read the story of Ona Judge who was um, the ensla an enslaved young woman who ran away from Martha and George Washington. So we read this book um, over several nights uh, for her bedtime story and we heavy reading for a six-year-old, I know, but <laughs> it's, she loves it. She yeah. loves it. 
So I heard, I overheard her while she was doing her little Zoom class and they were talking about George Washington and saying like, you know, they were saying that he was nice or doing something. And she said, well, he had slaves. He had a lot of them. He had hundreds of slaves. And so, so it was like, and he was not a nice man. Um, and the teacher stammered through that because I don't even think that she, she really knew. They don't teach it. They don't teach it. I mean, I bought, like I with Jack, like I've literally had to go online and do the research and kind of be like, you know, like books, not just written by people of color, but centering their stories as well. And so that's what I've like bought for my son, you know, and, and even we, we subscribe to this magazine called Honest History which is great because it talks about it's every month. And so this past one was as well India and how the British colonized it and how like, it was like not friendly and th you know, things like British that. man. Bro. I, mean, sometimes I think about that though, like for real, I watched the crown and I'm like, that is such a tiny little country of, I just, how did they, <laughs> well, these, the whole, I mean, they caused so much trouble, so much trouble. <laughs> Jesus, for real. And, and, Ooh. but it, you have to take like an active stand. Cause you think about like how far behind are we? Right. Cause people think, well, 2020 happened and BLM and everyone's there. So now it's all equal now. I'm like, no, look at what they're still teaching our children. Not, not nothing to say of how we have to unlearn and relearn so much, but what they're right. still teaching the younger generations, like this is still being perpetuated the white supremacy. I mean, it's still so it can be very quick. We can accelerate the change though. If we change the books, really pat, right. Pass the mic, put other people in the place of telling the stories, gave other people agency to tell their own stories. There's a, an entire campaign. I would urge the listeners to follow the um, hashtag own voices mm. um, campaign, which is basically just the, the idea that people should actually be able to tell their own stories. If a story is about a black child, like allow a black author to write that story so that the, the, the story and the experience is authentic and it's actually getting through because the way that we become more uh, connected to our humanity and have more empathy towards each other is to really know each other. Like Michelle Obama says is, you know, it's hard to, to hate somebody up close. It's nearly impossible to hate somebody up close. So if, if we're getting stories told by people that don't know, we're not really getting to know each other. Right, absolutely. And the way people are like, you know, yeah, I think sometimes, I mean, I feel like when I watch just regular TV, it's like when you think of like, I mean, the way Latinas are like perpetuated on television, like the stereotypes over and over again. And you're like, you can tell it's, or, or, or even just like not even like Latinx people representing that, like, like acting like them, like the fake accents. I mean, I know people with Scarface, but I'm sorry, like Al Pacino as like the Cuban who came on the Mario, like my mom came on the Mario boat lift, like what? No, like horrible, insulting, you know? And it's just right. So let people tell their own stories. Like put a Cuban actor, put you know an Ethiopian actress, you know, put like a Muslim actor, like put an Egyptian in there, like put people from like who like put a trans actor playing, like finally some finally. Well, some change we saw in 2020 with trans people playing trans yes. people, thank goodness. Right. And and you know the and disabled people people playing disabled people. Yes. And and you, there's this constant pushback. There's this narrative and it's coming from, again, a place of privilege that like we're actors and we should be able to play different roles. And that's what acting is. And we're authors of fiction and we should be able, yes, in a perfect world, this is kind of like the all lives matter argument in a perfect world. Yes, we should be able to use our imaginations and tell different stories. But the problem is, is that one perspective has been told for so long that one face has been shown for so long that we have to take it back. Yeah. We have to give it back, we have to take it back. It's our, our collective responsibility to make sure that we're all being heard. Right, and you people can vote with their dollars for listeners. It's like, seek out, don't just buy like those books on like the, you know, like the top that what's right in front of you, like seek out diverse work. authors, right? Seek out the work and do it. And that's, that's our responsibility too, as a consumer, right? Mm -hmm. To be more proactive and not just kind of like, you know, like the little birds in the mom's nest, just like giving, eating what they feed us, like go out and find, you know, the kind of content you want to consume. A black man makes my very fancy tea. Awesome. <laughs> because when I'm looking for my very fancy tea that I need to drink every day, it's like, let me get this from a black owned business. When I go into Etsy, um, he recent, he and his wife recently had a baby and I wanted to send her a gift because everyone's buying the baby stuff and 
poor lady. So I went on to Etsy and searched black owned businesses. And thank goodness Etsy has a whole, uh, the whole like department or a whole category. Right. So I was able to buy some beautiful bath things for her uh, from a black woman. Like yeah. it's just, and it's not even that, I mean, we have computers in our pocket. It's not that hard. I know when I like, I, I buy like my curly hair products. I make sure they're from black owned businesses. I mean like Thrive Market, even for food products, they yeah, literally need even like- hair routine, by the way. So thank you. I will yeah, send we'll it. talk about that separate. <laughs> like the thrive market has a whole section where you could be like what the black owned businesses that they carry i mean it's there and like people and like you know if you're getting indian spices like find them from an indian woman or like indian person who's making them like those kind of things i think we just need to um yeah be more cognizant about and it does take a little bit of like active consumerism i guess is the, i don't know if that's the right term but it sounds like it's right it yeah it, and it, and that's the word though active right. i mean that's the root of activism right. it's actually doing something it's yeah. not you can't be passive it's you know it's not pacifism <laughs> like right. we, have, we actually have to put forward an effort and, and you know i i do like i have a very um specific identity i'm biracial my dad's black my mother's white i'm cisgender um i my you know my pronouns are she they uh because you know honestly like if you want to call me they that's cool too because it's appropriate um, but I have a very specific identity. And when I'm writing about different characters, even in my books, when they're um, ancillary characters, they're you know, not the protagonist, I consult people. You know, my daughter has a disability that affects her mobility. So when I'm talking about uh, disabled folks, I, I ask her, like, is this appropriate to say, or would this be your experience? Or, it, you know, it's really important for everyone to understand their blind spots and understand that, you know, it's, it's so important to connect with other people to, to really be able to, you know, be, um, be in a, looking through a lens from social justice and, and equity. You have to open up your perspective. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's so important. I want to end, I know it's, we're out of time, but really quick about We Printing Press and Zara's Big Messy, like that whole series. And I know that you, speaking about schools because they, they're in schools as well so yeah. tell us a little bit about wheat penny press how people can sponsor a classroom and all that yes. kind of stuff so wheat penny press is my children's imprint that's under row house and what we do is we have a nonprofit as part of our business model, and it provides free books, workshops, author visits, both in person and virtual to schools in, we say struggling districts, right? Because I don't say underserved because there's a lot of amazing people serving them. So just districts that are struggling. And we um, have given away thousands of books. If you go to wheatpennypress.com, you can buy our books, which help us give more away, but you can also sponsor classrooms directly. And I don't take a salary as the founder. Uh, we, you know, get, everything goes to the service of the kids. Our authors are volunteers and it's a beautiful thing because these kids, I, I, my belief is, is that these kids are already so resilient. They're so strong. They're so brilliant that they don't need charity they just need to be shown what can be and when they see a black author walk into their classroom and be like i'm an author i write these books and i'm gonna hand these to you and it, it opens up a world of possibilities for them so i love we penny press buy my zara books <laughs> that are all about emotional health um, yes yeah it's it's all so good i love it i'm very proud of it yeah, I think it's a, it's phenomenal. The books are great. And I love that. And again, because they are about emotional health, mental health for children, which is again, often overlooked. Um, and so that's an amazing project. So go support that and row house as well. Taking, you know, like look it up, send your friends. Give us money. Donations, give them money. Exactly. <laughs> Invest. We have investment opportunity. Taking investment. Right. So that's amazing. I love everything you're doing, Bex. And Thank it's you. been a great hanging out with you. So thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Yeah. And everyone, where can they follow you at Bex Life on Instagram? Mm hmm and then bexlife.com is your website. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thanks everyone. See you next week. <laughs>